Michael Anthony Salters was born the day after Christmas in 1953 and raised uptown in northwest Washington, D.C. on Webster Street. Young Michael grew up believing he had to be a stable figure to keep his family afloat and together. He took it upon himself to provide for his loved ones the soonest that he could. Salters hungered for money since he was a kid and acquired it however he could. He and his friends would run around the streets doing whatever to get paid. Mike was part of two local gangs as a youth, the Marlboro 500, then the Rock Boys. As Mike got older he made a habit of armed robbery and heroin. He developed a love for boxing as well, which trained him to channel his aggression. He became competitive and wouldn't back down from fighting anyone with his hands. Throughout his life, Salters gained the respect of other fighters around him, including professional boxers who held championship titles. People called Salters Frey Bean originally because of his skinny build when he was younger. The shortened name Frey stuck with him for the rest of his life. Some also called him Horse Collar due to the thickness of his neck. Mike's teenage crimes as a stick-up kid soon caught up with him. One botched robbery attempt landed him a prison sentence in 1974, at the age of 19. Salters originally was placed in the now-defunct youth center at Lawton Reformatory in Laurel Hill, Virginia. His notoriety grew as a fighter behind bars. Another old-time hustler from uptown D.C. named Fats recalled in a Don Diva interview how Mike's presence was felt inside the institution. When I first got to the youth center in 1974, somebody broke into my locker. Frey went and got my stuff back and made the dude apologize. Salters also had a personal chair located in the rec hall and dared anybody to sit in it. His behavior led him to be transferred into the bullpen housing all mature convicts charged with more hostile robberies, rapes, murders, etc. He witnessed all kinds of assault around him daily. Frey stayed strong while incarcerated and began earning the respect of the other inmates. He shook off his drug addiction and focused solely on accumulating wealth. Building alliances around the reformatory with people from other sections of D.C. secured his ability in conducting business for himself in their respective territories of town once he was released. When he got out around 1978, Frey was introduced to a woman through a mutual friend of theirs. At the time, Frey was 24 and she was 17. What he had yet to know was that she was a local booster with a reputation. As she drove him that day, he explained his plans to become a millionaire. The two quickly hit it off and sparked a relationship. Frey was fronted an ounce of marijuana by his friend Wookie and immediately went to work. Within a couple of months, Mike turned that one ounce into pounds. He remained keen and also avoided debts, which kept his pockets rising. Frey then got into the heroin trade, distributing his brand called Black Snake. Word began to spread about him in uptown DC. He became more well-known in the city and started making appearances at venues, restaurants, and parties in fly clothing with his woman. His appearances with friends and associates began to dazzle those who witnessed. One night a hustler named Avon Little ran and snatched a purse from a woman, not knowing she was Frey's girlfriend. Little's body was later found near an alley off of Wiltsberger Street, a few blocks away from Howard University. Salters was charged with the murder but managed to beat the case due to witnesses not appearing in court. However he was fully on the radar of the federal government, and so he started to lay low, as did his friend Wookie. Frey was inevitably arrested in Jersey and extradited to Washington DC. All the while his girl was six months pregnant. Ironically, violating his parole sent him back to where he started, Lawton Reformatory. Still, he managed to coordinate deals in Buffalo, Rochester, Jersey, and Maryland. He ran his operation better than before from the inside with the aid of his girlfriend and crew. According to her, he was living relatively comfortably while incarcerated at the time. When he was back on the streets, Frey got to witness the birth of his first son. He spoiled his child with his riches and made sure his family knew how much he loved them. He also went straight back to work. A friend he knew while locked up gave Frey access to a stash containing about $100,000, which was stolen from a bank. With this extra capital and a plug for PCP based in California, Salters was ready to go. His angel dust floated through the streets and racked in thousands. 
he even secured part of Hanover Place Northwest, which had been an infamous spot to run drugs through since the 1970s in the days of people like Cornell M. Jones. Through the beginning years of the 1980s, Frey elevated to kingpin status. In June of 1984, Frey purchased a $250,000 custom chain, a gold elephant pendant smothered in diamonds. He first adorned it for the Tommy Hearns v. Roberto Duran boxing bout in Las Vegas. Afterward, his girlfriend expressed concerns about him being too deep in the game and asked him to leave it alone so they could be a family together. Unfortunately, he just couldn't withdraw from hustling, so she got a legitimate job, moved into a new apartment with her children, and refused any more of his money. By the summer of 85, Frey was generating millions of dollars from handling premium PCP, marijuana, cocaine, and especially heroin, his most lucrative trade. He soon recruited his ambitious young nephew Donnell Pucci Salters into his ranks to keep him close and guide him. As the second half of the 1980s progressed, the influence of crack sank its teeth deeper into the city of Washington, D.C., dubbed the nation's murder capital at the time. This was thanks in part to his plug connects, who were associates of Escobar's Medellin cartel. In comparison to Frey's laid-back, stern demeanor, Edmund was much more arrogant and loud which called for a lot of visibility. He seemed to relish in whatever kind of attention he got. Ray was also disrespectful to almost anyone, except Frey including his friends. This gave Frey the impression that he wouldn't last long in this game. Edmund's wealth attracted the attention of some rival hustlers from the Trinidad section of Northeast DC. Frey arranged a meeting between both parties by Howard University and explained to them how getting money was more important than killing each other. He managed to issue a truce, which awarded him $100,000 from Rafel just for delegating the situation. Rafel continued to directly offer Salter's lump sums of cash ranging from $100,000 to $250,000. He even gifted Frey's young nephew Pucci with a pure Colombian kilo of cocaine on consignment. All just to stay in Frey's good graces. Though Salter's and his crew still kept Edmund at a distance and stayed strictly business with him. Word got out that a member of Edmund's organization was talking down on Pooch's name, so Frey set up a meeting between both groups one night at the Old Breeze Metro Club. At the club, Frey and Pucci confronted Rafel and his man. Pucci proceeded to severely beat Edmund's man down on the spot, but he brandished a .357 Magnum in defense. As everyone inside fled from the commotion, the man found himself pointing the gun at the only one left standing there, Frey. Salters stared down the armed gunman and angrily asked, what do you plan to do with that? Besides, make me mad. Needless to say, Rafel called Frey on the phone the very next day and had his man from last night sincerely apologize for everything that he did. Afterward, Ray showered Frey in more gifts to avoid his bad side. Salter's extortions proved successful as Ray remained respectful and fearful of him. He considered everything he paid Salters as safety insurance. There was another time that Frey witnessed Rafel's cousin fighting with someone in the parking lot of the Chapter 3 club. The two men pulled out guns and shot at each other as Frey laughed and walked away to his car. But as he sat inside the vehicle, he noticed a hole in his Versace shirt and realized one of the bullets from the shootout grazed him. This immediately infuriated him, though Frey calmed down when Edmund found out and coughed up $200,000 plus a brand new Range Rover. By this point, Mike Salters was regarded as the ambassador of Chocolate City. His reach extended to seemingly anywhere. He was loved by friends, musicians, professional athletes, politicians, prison inmates, and so many random onlookers that caught a glimpse of him. His crew recalls the regularity with which women swooned over him for years, but he never paid it much mind. He wasn't the type to fall for anyone's seduction. And after shaking his old heroin addiction long ago, Frey abstained from drug usage and alcohol. He always kept his mind clear. Being such a high-profile figure in the city meant Frey knew everyone important. The mother of his children recalled how he'd stop by Mayor Marion Barry's estate to drop duffel bags off in the middle of their outings. This was clean before anyone even knew Barry indulged in drugs. Federal agents once wiretapped a person's phone call in which they mentioned Frey bribing a defense attorney with five grand in order to get some information. Fat Rodney was a go-go musician that was wrongfully killed at a skating rink the same year he took this picture with Frey. 
regarded by many as the king of DC, Frey had the position to continue mitigating tensions between rival drug crews. He would even get paid to personally delineate the local territories in which specific narcotics organizations were allowed to conduct business. With words alone, he settled the violent beef between two warring drug-dealing factions on the south side of town before things got too bloody. Everyone, even the wildest of killers, respected him that much. He knew many across the nation from New York City's Kenneth Supreme McGriff to the late NBA draft pick Len Bias. When Len was still a college basketball star, Frey often tried keeping him on the right path. Salters believed in the young man's potential to make something of himself and warned Bias against using drugs and hanging around the wrong people. So, when Len Bias passed away from a cocaine overdose, Frey was enraged and wished to kill whoever sold the drugs to his friend in the first place. During the spring of 1989, Frey was coordinating a drug deal involving 5 kilograms of cocaine and 10 bricks of pure heroin. While doing so, he discovered Rafael Edmund was raided by law enforcement. Salters laid low in case Edmund had snitched and compromised him. Frey stayed in hiding at a friend's garage for weeks. While there, a man in his crew named Michael Jackson asked if he could get fronted half a kilo of coke. Frey met Jackson before in prison, but they weren't close. He frequently made jokes about Michael, especially about how he dressed, and yet all Jackson could ever do in response was laugh along. But Frey still wanted Jackson to have a chance at getting some money. So he gave Michael a whole cocaine brick instead of just half. Frey once bumped into a messy-looking Wayne Silk Perry at a restaurant on 9th Street. There, Silk offered to be Frey's trigger man if need be, but Salters respectfully declined in light of the pressure he felt from the feds. After departing, Salters had his people check up on Perry's history to find out who he was. Frey later heard from his people in New York City about everything in Harlem involving AZ. Faison's robbery, the death of Rich Porter, and the sudden disappearance of Alpo Martinez. Based on how Martinez moved, Frey himself deduced who truly killed Porter and confronted Alpo about it when he drove past him in D.C. Frey also warned Alpo not to hustle in his city. Eventually, he demanded that Alpo leave altogether, and Martinez had no choice but to openly respect his wishes at the moment. Alpo continued trying to set up shop in Washington regardless, though it wasn't easy. He encountered a lot of friction and aggression there, and people were muscling in on his supply of drugs. Frey himself had allegedly taken 10 kilos from Alpo without consequence. Inevitably, he and Martinez put hits out on each other. Frey put a price on Silk's neck as well, who was now Alpo's primary enforcer and most dangerous soldier. After he failed to repay his debts, Frey pressed Michael Jackson. He feared for his life when Salters demanded he fix it within the next few days. Somehow Alpo caught wind of the dispute and commissioned a scared Jackson to kill Frey to eliminate the issue. Martinez offered Jackson a 9mm, half a brick, and $9,000. He also claimed he'd support Jackson in the aftermath of the murder. Michael set up a meeting with Frey on the night of July 16, 1991. Salters was waiting in his car at the intersection of 1st Street Northwest and Bryant Street Northwest when an unidentified gunman pulled up and shot him six times. Frey's brother was nearby observing in a van and ran into Salters' car to drive his dying brother to medical aid. Frey was left at the entrance of Washington Hospital Center around 10.30 p.m. and declared dead at 1 a.m. His nephew Pucci was devastated by this while in jail awaiting a murder trial. He allegedly got the prison guards to bring a now-incarcerated Silk into a private cell with him so they could be alone. There, Silk was beaten down and suffered severe head injuries. Pucci continued going on a rampage targeting anyone he believed was involved with his uncle's murder. Inevitably, Pucci himself was gunned down as well. While Michael Jackson disappeared, Frey left behind a legacy throughout the whole nation. Convicts across the country were blessed and kept in good condition because he looked after them. He consistently gave one friend 20 grand apiece since they were on the rundown in Houston. He provided a lot of community services through his storefronts and businesses in the city. And he did his best to make the ones closest to him feel as loved and respected as he did. He believed everything he did was always for his family first.